2 Timothy chapter number 4, the very familiar portion of Scripture we're going to start reading in verse number 1. It says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching, e having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for the reading of your word. Lord, we're thankful for the songs. Lord, we're thankful for the blood. We're thankful for the fact that you still save. Lord, we're thankful for the fact that you love us the way you do, Lord. We're thankful for the message you laid upon my heart. Lord, just help me to convey it here to your people the same way that you gave it to me. Lord, it can be a help to each and every one of us. Lord, and just thank you for everything you've done for me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm uh, going to get started, you know, uh, I'm sitting here and as I was praying, Brother Phil, it just slowly, I, I don't know why all of a sudden it did, but I'm usually nervous beforehand and I was, uh, but standing here praying, I just, just started shaking. Uh, it was funny, we're getting ready tonight and Bella will always ask, you know, are you nervous? Are you nervous? You got this, you got this. So she asked me before I left, said, Brother Aiden, she goes, are you nervous? I was like, nope. She goes, What? You know, that wasn't the answer she was looking for. She wanted to be able to tell me it was going to be okay. Uh, but, you know, introduction, I have, you know, the Lord has started burdening my heart last night. I have a whole introduction, I guess what our pastor would call a Thaddeus introduction. I had a real long introduction, and the Lord started burdening me last night and all through today, and I've looked at this probably half a dozen times uh, throughout today, and uh, well, I could go through the introduction. I just believe the Lord wants us to look at a couple verses here uh, by way of introduction. In verses number three and number four, uh, you think of the current times that we live in. And you look at the times that we live in, it talks about in verse number three, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Right. And we look at that, and we so many times look at that, and we, we portray that, and, or whatever you want to say the right word is, and want to think of the world right there, Brother Phil. What about church people? How much do we not endure sound doctrine? Right. How much are those that, that come to church, and even maybe on a Wednesday night crowd, don't endure sound doctrine? We don't want to listen to truly what the Bible has to say about certain things. We don't necessarily like the different things of the Bible, and we don't, have, we don't like that sound doctrine. Instead, we like to you know, heap themselves to teachers having itching ears. Uh, why do so many people you still see today that came from Baptist churches that will go to all these big churches or these other churches or whatever because they're not interested in sound doctrine. They're just interested in going to church and feeling better about myself. If you came to church tonight just to feel better about yourself, you need to check up. Uh, just plain, I don't know any other way to put it. I'm not telling you're not saved, but you need to do some checking up on where your heart's at on where you truly are, because that's not the point of coming to church just to feel better about ourselves. But we look at the world so much, but there's a lot more to it than just strictly the world. In verse number 4, it says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. It's amazing today how much we just completely won't acknowledge the truth. The Bible will tell us something we're supposed to do, or we need to abide by, or whatever it may be. Well, but I think I'll do this. Yeah. What does the Bible say? Right. And how we, we spend no time truly learning the truth for ourselves. You know, we all know we're in election time, and the election's coming up, and, and you have the nonsense that's being spewed, and I actually got uh, a little bit about that in my devotion this upcoming Friday, and, and all this nonsense that's being spewed by both sides. And, but people don't want to spend the time to truly search things out and know the truth. Right. The same thing for church members, unfortunately, sometimes. How much do we truly look and try to discover the truth? And that's how we then become turned unto fables. We become turned unto falseness. That's why we can have somebody tell us and you begin to question your pastor. Well, we've always heard this and been taught this, but so-and-so told me this. 
because we've not searched out the truth for ourselves, Brother Ron. We don't know what we truly believe. We can't take people and show them in the Bible what we believe. It's just what our pastor said or what grandma and grandpa said or whatever it may be. So I wanted to just look at, you know, those two things right there, verse 3. The current times that we're in, we can look at that as the world, but it also has a lot to do with church members. It has a lot to do with ourselves and how much we won't listen to sound doctrine, how much we will turn our ears away from the truth because that doesn't fit our agenda. It doesn't fit what we want to do. And instead, we want to go about our own way. But to get to the message, we need to look down. I'm not going to preach on all that, so don't, don't get too tore up on me here. I want to look down at verse number 7. Well, first, verse number 6. Paul's writing to young Timothy here, and he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and time my departure is at hand. When we get to the message, I want you to think about, can we say this verse right here? I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Can we, when we get to that, that time, you know, we have no idea. We know as Bible believers that are here at church on a Wednesday night, I believe we all believe without a shadow of a doubt nothing else has to take place for Jesus to return, which means nothing else has to take place for him to call us up out of here. We could be gone before tomorrow. So if you were called into eternity tomorrow, could you make that statement? I have, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. The story that was in that men's meeting was a young man by the name of William Borden. William Borden was born in the late 1800s, and he was born, and he was pretty much just a millionaire, Brother Charlie. Had all the money he could possibly could want. At the age of 16, he, tra- he got the opportunity to travel the world. The one thing that struck him, Brother Josh, about traveling the world at age of 16 is how many people didn't know the Lord. How many people didn't have Jesus? How many people had no idea what that was? That burdened him so much that when he got back home, that's all he wanted to do. He wanted to be a missionary. He wanted to be able to go around and tell people about the Lord. He settled on teaching the Muslim people in a certain spot in China, and it, it had a weird name, and I didn't know how to pronounce it, so I didn't even put it in my notes or anything. But it's in northwestern China. He decided that's where the Lord would have him to go and teach the Muslims. So he graduates high school. He ends up at Yale. Imagine the difference now. You, there's no way you could do this at Yale nowadays. It wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be allowed. But he gets to Yale where he engages in many uh, gospel-sharing ministries in several capacities, and, he, and he just, that's where he developed his burden for the Muslim people. And he goes, and he's going to leave Yale after he graduates Yale, and he's going to go teach those people. Well, he makes a stop along the way to study Arabic. While in Cairo, he contracted cerebral meningitis and died in 1913 at the age of 25. 25 was it. When the word of his death made it back to the United States, it ignited a fervency for the Lord in missions among the thousands of college students that were there at Yale. The reality of wealth and fame that Borden had set aside and for the sacrifices he made to live simply with the Arabic family in Cairo. He died alone in a foreign country all for the sake of Christ and the gospel. He's buried in an American cemetery in Cairo, Egypt, inscribed and inscribed in the top of his grave marker are these six words, and that's what I'm going to preach on tonight. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. Can we live our life with no reserves, no retreats, and no regrets? Can we live our life when you think of the word reserve? You think of reserve, you're not going to hold nothing back. We're going to give it our all in every aspect that we have. Can we say that we have no reserve in just the simple, the very first rule of our church of minding God? Amen. Can we say that we have no reserve when it comes to minding God? And these, uh, you know, these next couple things are something our pastor talked about last Wednesday quite a bit. And, and no reserve in minding God about our work for the Lord. What is it that God would have you to do? Do we have not, not holding back on anything it is that he'd have you to do? We too many times want to dabble in certain things. We should be thankful. We should never take... Uh, we've heard our pastor talk so many times of all the churches that he goes to and how 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people. We should be so thankful that that's not the case here. But even when that's not the case here, do we still wholeheartedly give everything we have to whatever it is that our job is? Do we wholeheartedly give everything that we have to whatever we have going on? When was the last time you ever walked into our church and you seen dead flowers all over the grounds? When was the last time you walked into church, you pulled in and thought, Dad, gone? When was the last time he mowed? A month ago? 
When was, you, when was the last time you walked in and you're, you're picking up paper or whatever it may be as you walk in because the church is so dirty? That's because people will have no reserve in doing what they want to do. Right. They, get, they will not hold back in making sure that they give the best they have for God. Right. Do we do the same thing whatever it is that we want to do? Amen. Or whatever it is that God would have us to do? Do we not hold back in whatever it is, whatever, whatever the Lord has laid on our heart to do, do we make sure that we hold nothing back? Do we have no reserve in minding God when it comes to worship? Amen. How many times do we sit here, this, is, this, this could just be me, Brother Ron, maybe I'm the problem. But how many times we sit and we sing the young people or we see the choir singing on Sunday morning and they're singing about how good God is and how wonderful God is and you just sit there and you think we should, be, we should just be kicking the walls out. Right. And here we sit. Amen. I'm not telling you you got to shout like brother, like brother Phil, you ain't got to run like Brother Phil, but are we truly not holding anything back when it comes to our worship? Do we truly say if God wants us, if, if God's going to bring tears in our eyes, are we fighting it to hold it back or are we just letting her go? If, if God truly tells us that we need to raise our hand or shout amen or run a lap or whatever, are we doing it? Or are we trying to say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little too sophisticated to be running a lap. I can't be doing that. I'm better than that. They'll, they'll make fun of me or laugh at me. Well, let them make fun of you or laugh at you. Life's too short to be holding anything back. Do we have no reserve not only in our work for the Lord, in our worship of the Lord, but just in our walk? with God in our walk but that leads me to the second thing do we have no reserve in making room for God I greatly <laughs> yeah I was talking to brother Tommy asked brother Tommy last night because brother our pastor mentioned last Thursday they were going to be gone and I didn't know when they were leaving and he was here last night for uh, uh, the Bible Institute and I asked him I said when y'all leaving he said, not till Friday morning. He said, you can't get rid of us that, that easy. I'm like, I know who's preaching tomorrow night. If I was you, I would leave. You know, I was like, I know. I, I truly appreciate the fact that you would come. I truly appreciate the fact that you're here. Amen. But how many people could be here? Yeah. Because we ain't got room for God. Amen. We have room for God when, as long as it's convenient. Right. What about when it's not convenient? What about when we get up tomorrow and we know we're going to have a busy day and we oversleep by 30 minutes and instead of taking the time still to read our devotion or read a little bit of scripture or to pray, we just say, I, I got to go on and get my day done. I got stuff I got to do. I got to get this done. I got to get that done. And if I have time to get it at the end of the day, I'll do that. We need to have no reserve in making room for God. He should be the first thing on our mind when we wake up and the last thing on our mind when we go to bed. But too many times we almost have to schedule him in. Yeah. We almost have to put it, and I've said before, if that's what it's got to be, then put him on the calendar. But he better be filling up that calendar but instead of with other stuff. Think about the fact that we can find two different people, and I know there's more than that, but two different people we find in the Bible, in Enoch and Noah, and it says they walked with God. Could the same thing be said about you? Not you as a church member, not, hey, he was a great person, not, he, uh, not that, hey, he, he showed up, did this, but you could truly tell he walked with God. We have no reserve, we should have no reserve in making room for God. Amen. Can I say this thirdly? We should have no reserve in moving mountains to get the gospel out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every single one of us, if I ask this to, could raise hands that we have lost family members, we have lost neighbors, we have lost co-workers, we have lost whatever else it may be. What are we, tr are we truly doing all we can to get the gospel out? You yourself. Now, I'm not talking about Emmanuel Baptist Church. I'm not talking about who might go out on visitation. Are you doing what you can to get the gospel out? It might be all you can do is pray for safety for all those that go out on Monday night. It might be all you can do is to be able to sit home and, and, and put the tracks in bags and, and amen, we absolutely need that, and that is wonderful. That's all you can do. But are we truly doing everything we can to get the gospel out? Can I say that there, think about this, I, I order all the tracks. I believe the little thank you sincerely ones, I think, I, I'm pretty sure I've said this before, and so I'm trying to run through it and go through it in my head. I think I ordered 2,000, maybe 3,000 this last time. If, I don't know how many of us there are, but let's just say we average 100 of us. If everybody just passed out, you know, one a day, I mean, you're looking at those 2,000 shouldn't last me more than a month. But it's already been, I think, a month. 
since I ordered them, and there's still some back there. Are we truly doing all we can to get the gospel out? How hard is it to, you know, and my problem is I'll forget to get them. So, Miss Lisa, I need to ask her to give me pointers. I'm making sure I always have them. And I don't mean to point her out. I just know she passes them out. But are we truly doing all we can to get the gospel out? How hard is it to drop a track somewhere? How hard is it to leave it with your tip on the table? How hard is it to just live that life to where we, we just talked about that you're walking with God and making room for God that it just shows on you that somebody can say, you're a Christian, aren't you? You're saved, aren't you? You're different, aren't you? When was the last time anybody said that to us? Are we doing, are we moving mountains to get the gospel out? We all just said a little bit ago, we agree our time's running out. What are we holding back from God? What are we holding back from giving Him? Are we giving him that full as that, you know, 110% that we're willing to give anything else? We'll give it to our job. We'll give it to our hobby. We'll give it to our spouse, maybe. We'll give it to what? Are we giving the same thing to God? If there's anything in our life that we put more effort into than what we put into serving God, we got a problem. We're holding back from what God expects from us. He's not held nothing back from us. Okay, he's not holding anything back from us. Think about the fact of where we could be tonight. Right. I mean, hey, it, it could have stormed and knocked power out. We might even be able to meet tonight. We could, you could be the one that was born in some country that you're having to meet underground if you even wanted to meet tonight. Or better yet, you might have had some language. You don't even have the Bible in your language yet. Yeah. Amen. No reserve in what we're doing for him. Can I say could we need to have, one, no reserve. The second two words on those is no retreat. We need to have no retreat on the Scripture. Right. It's amazing, you know, our, we talked about a little bit this last Thursday uh, in men's meeting about some of the churches even in the area, Baptist churches in our area that no longer preach the King James Bible. Baptist churches that have stood for so long on the Bible right. no longer find it relevant. All, way, all of a sudden now want to have a, a different, if you want to call it, version or a different copy of it or whatever. We need to have no retreat on Scripture. Not only just on the King James Bible, but what the Scripture says. Right. We have so many things that are going on in this world that want to be a direct attack to the Bible. I, I, I wish I could remember now what it was that they said, but it, it was poking fun. and uh, You know, it's... I'll get to that in a minute. Remind me, I'll get to that one in a minute. I was going to use something as an illustration, but I'll do it then on the next one. We need to not back up on Scripture. We need to make sure that we stand on what Scripture says. That's why, you know, we can never put enough Scripture in us. That's why it amazes me that the people that don't think Sunday school, they need Sunday school, or don't think they need this, or don't think they need that. I'm sorry, I just don't know it all yet. Maybe you do. Good for you. Amen. I need to study more than you, than you evidently. But we need more Scripture. We need to not retreat, not back up on Scripture. That is why we are in the condition that we are in. This is, just, this is my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. I've shared this at the jail. I, I might have shared it here. I don't know. I remember growing up when people come out of the closet, you put them back in the closet, so to speak. And I remember growing up when those things were said, you let us do in our bedroom what we want to do, and you just stay out of it. And that's what we did. We didn't make a stand on what Scripture says. Scripture calls it an abomination. Right. And now where are we at? Now things have gone completely wacko. Because Christians weren't willing to stand on Scripture. Right. We weren't willing to stand on, no, the Bible calls it an abomination. Not that you're okay to do what you do and I'll do what I do. But right. we've slowly backed up on Scripture, and it's got us into a mess. Not only do we need to have no retreat on Scripture, we need to have no retreat on making a stand. How many times are we given an opportunity to just make a stand for the Lord? How many young people in here, and I don't know, there, there might only be one or two, I have no idea. How many young people in here have skipped a practice or skipped a game or something of that nature because you was going to come to church? I'm not going to practice tonight because I want to go to church. I'm not going to practice or I'm not going to my game because I want to go to church. I want to go to revival. How many of us adults can say the same thing? When it comes to, now look, I'm not talking about if you're forced to work, you got to work, that's a completely different story. But how many times have our bosses asked us, hey, does anybody need any overtime this week? Yeah, I could use the extra money. And it takes us out of church. 
Yeah, I could use I could use the extra of this. It's Christmas time's coming up. I can get the kids something nicer for Christmas. So then we we choose to go to work, Brother Phil, right. and it takes us away from the house of God. Right. I remember, and this is not you know I am not anybody special. I, I remember back. I think it was right during COVID or right before COVID, and the, the spot that I work at at work, Brother Josh knows where I work. We was told you'll never be forced to work overtime. That's what I remember being told. You'll never be forced to work overtime. And they came up and told us, hey, this week we're going to have to go in, we're going to have to open up all the electrical panels in every single building and vacuum them all out, and we're going to do that over the next couple of weeks, and you're going to have to work Saturday and Sunday both. I'm not working Sunday. Everybody's going to work Sunday. I'm not working Sunday. Everybody's going to work Sunday. Okay. So I went and talked to HR. I was told I would never be forced to work, Brother Clint. I'm not working Sunday. I'll work any other day. I'll come in and work Sunday if you want to, 2 to 6, 3 to 7, whatever, but I'm going to church. Well, we'll see what happens and, 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 and what happens when it gets there. Well, lo and behold, what was going to take us two days took us like four hours on a Saturday or whatever it was. It was ridiculous. But just being willing to make a stand. No, I'm going to church. I'll work Sunday if you want. I'll work whatever time it is as long as I'm going to be done in order to go to church. But too many times we're not willing to make a stand. Why do we have sports that... I will be completely honest. I have not, I, I don't think, I don't even think Brother Adrian's this old. So I, I'm not, I, I can't say for sure, but I've read multiple stories that when Major League Baseball first started playing on Sundays, they would stop before whatever time so people could go to church. But somewhere along the line, we just allowed it to filter in and filter in, and now all of a sudden it takes all of our kids away on Wednesdays and Sundays and, and everything in between. Why? Because we wasn't willing to make a stand. We're not willing to make a stand for what we believe is right. Amen. You see the nonsense going on in this world. How many Christians are going to be willing to make a stand? Well, I don't want to say anything and ruffle feathers. I'm not telling you that you have to say something and ruffle feathers. Just be willing to make a stand if it comes to it. If somebody comes and wants to say, you got to do this or that or whatever it may be, no, I'm, th this, is, this is what's right. It's amazing how you've seen, you know, back... During all the nonsense of COVID and some of that, those people that were willing to make a stand and how they turned out, some, uh, you know, most of them, to be right. Yeah. Yeah. We need to be willing to be, make that stand for the same thing when it comes to the Word of God. Yeah. We too many times want to cower because we're afraid of what the consequences are. So, once again, I said it on Sunday. You believe God can save you. You believe God sent His Son to die on the cross for your sins. You're going to spend eternity in heaven. You don't believe He can take care of you? You don't believe if you make a stand on the job or whatever it may be, you don't think he can't take care of you? Right. Why are we so scared to make a stand? We need to have no retreat, no backing up in Scripture, no backing up in our willingness to make a stand. And the illustration I was going to use, I was reading, I don't know if anybody's seen this. i seen a post about it, I believe it was yesterday, that Chick-fil-A has announced they're going to have their own streaming service. I have no, Tina was asking me today what I was saying. I have no idea. Don't know what it's going to stream. I have no clue. Maybe they're going to stream chickens. I don't know. They're just, or I guess it's cows, ain't it? They're cows is their thing. They're just going to stream. Where's Olivia? What, what are y'all going to stream, Olivia? Do you know? She didn't even know they was going to have a streaming service. She just works there. She don't know. But I seen, I seen a post about it, and then underneath of it, I seen a post about somebody saying they would never stream anything from those, and I don't even remember now what they called them, make fun of them because of the stands that they make. Well, you know what? You can make fun of them all you want, and you don't have to stream. They sure seem to be doing okay for themselves, Brother Ron, for their willingness to make a stand. Somebody, do you not know that they support this and this? I don't, I, they might support against whatever. But they seem to be doing pretty good for themselves, being willing to every now and then just stand up for certain things. Right. We need to have no retreat on making a stand. We need to have no retreat on scriptures. We need to have no retreat on our Savior. You think our Savior? What are you talking about, Brother Josh? I've been here, me and Tina have been here now for a little over 22 years at Emmanuel Baptist Church. A lot of you, Brother Randy, Miss Kathy, Brother May, Miss Pam, you know, not, are traveling. Others that have been here that was here before us. I'm trying to think who else is here tonight that was here before us. Miss Marcy, maybe. How full would our church be with all those that have quit? Yeah. I'm not talking about those that have moved away, those that have something like that. I'm talking about those that just don't even go to church anymore, probably. Right. Why? What did God do to them that they would quit on God? Yeah. A lot of times, nothing. It was whatever reason they decided just to quit. They just turned their back and walked away from the Savior. I don't understand it. I just, I, I, I don't understand it. I, 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 I fail to grasp for everything that he's done for me. I fail to grasp as seeing people who've been in church, knowing everything he's done for them, and just deciding, I don't want to go anymore. Yeah. 
And hey, I, maybe I'll wake up tomorrow and be that. I, I don't know. I just, I, it, it, it boggles my mind how so many times we're willing to turn our back on the Savior, the one that gave us everything, and we're willing to just turn away from him and walk away from him. No reserve, no retreat. And the last two, no regrets. We'll have no regrets in standing for God. Right. Yeah, I brought it up and alluded to it. Any of you young people, any of you that, that may have stood and, and, and said you weren't going to go to practice or you skipped practice, whatever, did any of you have any regrets? Have any of you ever done it? Did you have any regrets in making that stand? Do you have any regrets in anything that you've ever done in that time that you've had to make a stand for the Savior? See, we have so many times that we get so scared and we're afraid of what the consequences are. God will take care of you. We, we have a, 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 a Bible full of people that when they made stands, you know, the last few weeks in the men's uh, meeting, we've talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've talked about Daniel. That's just the name those right there. I believe they were willing to make a stand, a pretty big stand. And they were faced, I would guess, with things that we would never dream of facing today. Right. Think about the fact. You go to your work and you make a stand, you might, what, lose your job? Well, I can't lose my job right now. There's plenty of places that are hiring. I understand it would be scary if he was without a job. For I get all those things, but I don't think anybody, Brother Clint, is going to threaten to throw us in a firing, uh, burning, fiery furnace. I don't believe there's a den of lions around here anywhere that somebody's going to pick us up and throw us into. I could be wrong. I mean, there's some crazy people out there. They might have. We might have the Lion King guy or whatever his name was might live around here somewhere. I don't know. But chances are we're not going to face any of those things if we're willing to make a stand. We might have somebody, you know, we talk about going out on visitation. There's been just a small handful of times you've ever had anybody, if you came in contact with anybody, anybody tell you no that they didn't want it. They might take it and turn around and throw it away. I don't know. But we did what we were supposed to do. That's between them and God at that point. Very rarely do you ever have anybody tell you they don't want it. So I would have to say that the worst thing they might have if we're willing to make a stand, somebody might be mad at us. Somebody might not like us or whatever it may be, or somebody might say something bad about us, but yet we're so worried and scared to make a stand that too many times we just cower. We will have no regrets if we're willing to make a stand for God. We will have no regrets if we're willing to just, when you look at all this nonsense that's going on, right. to be willing to stand and say, no, let God be true and every man a liar. Right. Living our life with no regrets. I would say that Paul, that's exactly what he got to here, is after he got saved, when he could say, I have fought a good fight, I finished my course, I have kept the faith. He did everything that God had wanted him to do, and he was, was very satisfied with what he had done. If God came back tomorrow, would we be satisfied? Would you be satisfied, and would you have no regrets in your serving the Lord? Or would you be, like our pastor has said multiple times, I believe a lot of the other preachers have said it here, a hundred years from now, all that's going to matter is what you've done for him. If the Lord was to call you out of here tonight, are you going to walk into heaven with regrets in what you've done to serve him? Are you going to, and I know it don't work that way, but just, you know, if, if you had that five minutes to look back, man, if I wish I'd done that. I wish I'd done that. I wish I'd went across the street. I wish I'd told my, this person or that person or whatever it may be. I wish I'd raised my hand and shouted that time in church. I wish I'd done this or done that. Or, done. or are you going to be able to walk out of here with no regrets? I did exactly what God wanted me to do. And see, the thing about it, we get so caught up, I think, I'm, maybe this is just me, we get so caught up in the times thinking, well, what if God asked me to do this? What if God asked me to do that? What if God just asked you to help Brother Rod open the door for people to come in? What if God just asked you to sit in here on a pew and make sure that you're, you're, you have that prayer room at home and you're just praying one for another? Right. What if God just asked you just to be the one to shout amen and encourage every preacher that walks in and out of here? See, it's not all about being a, a missionary in some third world country or whatever it may be. It's just about allowing God to do whatever he can do and just serving him in whatever capacity you can. Sometimes it might take us out of our comfort zone. Sometimes it might take us out. We might be a little nervous about things. It might be a little scary about certain things. Trust me, I'm about to embark on something that, that has me an absolute nervous wreck. You think, you, you think get nervous here. Imagine going to all kinds of different churches and presenting something and talking about something of people you have no idea who they are. It freaks me out just thinking about it. But if God's opened a door, 
I believe we was taught one time, if God opens a door, we need to go through it. We need to not be scared about what we want. I just want to serve God and just do this or do that. No, just serving God in whatever capacity we have and have no regrets. Can I say, I brought this up, and I'm not trying to talk about anybody else or anything, but having that no regrets in serving God is just doing exactly whatever it is that God would have you to do. I think about many times years ago, this was before uh, Brother Phil was here and, and preaching, and, and we had a preacher's class, Brother Ron. Brother Doug would teach it, usually him and Brother Larry McGuffey would switch off week after week. And I'll never forget, in probably more than one of those classes, they would talk to all of us that were young preachers back then, and they would, they, one thing that always tells you, serve God in whatever capacity he has for you, wherever you're at. Don't think you've got to go do this. Don't think you've got to go do that. You ain't got to go be a pastor here or, or be this or be that. You just allow God to use you whatever it is. And how many of those fellas that have heard that aren't in church anywhere anymore because they had to go run and do what they wanted to do? Now, some of them absolutely, I'm sure, probably are. But I can think of how many of those preachers that we had at one point in time in this church that, oh, I need to go do this or go do that or go here or go there without giving a second thought to if they were truly serving God or serving your own desires. I have found in my life you'll never have any regrets in serving Him however He wants you to serve Him. Right. No, excuse me, no, now I forgot, the, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. When I read that story and wrote those six words, I just sat there and just thought for I don't know how long. Almost just moved me to tears just sitting there thinking, how many of us can we say live our life that way? That we could have that statement said about our life. And this fellow was a millionaire. Keep in mind, a millionaire back in the early 1900s. He died at only 25, and that was what he was known for saying. No reserve, no retreats, no regrets, and lived his life that way. Gave up everything that too many times we aspire to get for the work of the Lord, to die alone in a foreign country with nobody else around. And yet God's placed us somewhere where we have the best of everything, and sometimes, nah, we'll hold back. We don't want to give him everything because I want to be able to do what I want to do. Or we'll back up on Scripture, we'll back up on whatever it will be, and we're going to walk out of here with plenty of regrets, I'm afraid, because we're running out of time to do something for Him. I ask all of you to stand, Brother Daniel, Brother Clint, you come get a song of invitation. What can you say? Paul, when he told Timothy he was ready, he had fought the good fight, he had finished his course, he had kept the faith, can you say the same thing about you if you was to be out of here? Can you say that you're living your life doing exactly what it is that God wants you to do? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for this day. Lord, we are thankful for the Word of God. Lord, we're thankful for not only people in the Bible, but other people that have gone on before us, Lord, that we can look at and just glean from and learn from. Lord, I ask you to speak to hearts during this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.